Okay, does my apartment just like attract stars or something? Ah, text box. Gotcha. Alright, well, that's good to know. Might as well go find something to keep myself occupied. So, is this him now, or...? No, never mind. I don't care. At least I finally get to take a look at the first proper Mario game for the Wii. Super Mario Galaxy was released in November of 2007, just four years after the beloved Super Mario Sunshine. It was first shown off to the public at E3 in 2006 with a playable demo which looks rather different to the final product with certain bits and pieces of levels from the final game merged together into some level called Starland. Super Mario Galaxy came out a whole year after the Wii was released so people were anxiously waiting the next big Nintendo game since people had just been playing Zelda Twilight Princess all year. That are Wii Sports, and considering the last main series Mario game to come out was Sunshine, fans were hoping for another explorative level based platformer like Super Mario 64. So, were these fans happy? Thankfully, yes. Well, for the most part at least. Super Mario Galaxy received critical acclaim across the board, with most review scores being around the 9.5 mark, leading it to being one of the all time highest rated games on Metacritic, so what makes this game so great anyway? Super Mario Galaxy opens up with Mario running gleefully towards Princess Peach's castle amidst what's called the Star Festival. Looking all around you can see star bits falling from the sky as toads surround the area looking on in wonder, when suddenly things get pretty intense as an onslaught of Bowser and his minions invade the area with the usual goal, to kidnap Princess Peach. Of course! Wait, wait, nah, doesn't fit here, never mind. We see Princess Peach hugging a starship creature called a Luma. We'll get to those, but it's odd. Princess Peach just has that Luma with no real explanation. The game doesn't tell you and it's really never brought up again, but most people have presumed that when Bowser started attacking, the Luma was just caught up in the action, knocked off his little planet, and then found by Princess Peach. Now it seems like a bit of a cop out answer, but it's probably the best one we'll ever get. This might have at one point been told in the game properly, but as is typical with Mario games, Shigeru Miyamoto, resident Nintendo creative fellow, stepped in and with his infinite wisdom, just cut the story from Galaxy because I guess he just hates video games. Hey, I ain't knocking the guy, but once you see the remnants of the story that are still present in the game, you might end up feeling the same as me. Disappointed. Cut forward to Mario in space along with Peach's castle in one last attempt to save her, but try as he might, ends up just being shot off into the cold, dead reaches of space when he suddenly gets attacked by a magic Koopa. And then... I mean, are you kidding me? He's straight up dead. He is now in the afterlife. There's no question. It's an easy conclusion to jump to. I guarantee you there are some crazy fan theories that Super Mario Galaxy is some kind of dying dream. Yep. People think he's dead. I guess. Why not, right? I mean, you see him get blasted off into space, then it cuts to black, and he suddenly wakes up in a bed of flowers. Conspiracy? But yeah, after dying, I guess, Mario wakes up on a small planet where he meets the universal enigma that is Rosalina. This mysterious character has somewhat of a backstory, but Nintendo hates me. Regardless, we'll get to that later. After a short chat with Rosalina, you agree to help her retrieve all of the power stars from Bowser, and in return for the help, she gives you her Luma friend, who bestows the power of being able to travel in space, as Rosalina says, although all that really means is spinning! Yeah, Mario can spin now, which is an integral skill that's heavily used throughout every part of the game. And I ain't talking about fidget spinning. Along with the Luma's spin, this game introduces Star Bits. These little glittery space rocks are Super Mario Galaxy's new collectible, and they are everywhere. You can get them from the bushes, from crystals, in question blocks. You can beat them out of enemies. They can even just randomly drop from the sky. And what are Star Bits? They're everything. They're ammo for attacking enemies from a distance. I mean, they won't kill an enemy, but they will disorient them. They're a currency, but also a food. You can get a 1-up if you collect 50 of them, and they're so commonplace, so easy to collect since just pointing the Wiimote at them makes them fly to you. And these little candy looking things hold such an emphasis in Galaxy that they're effectively better than the staple Mario Gold coin. In saying that, gold coins are still present in the game, but they're nowhere near as useful as star bits. Like in past 3D Mario games, they serve as Mario's health pickup to replenish lost health. 
but they can be a bit trickier to find. You can still find them in the telltale places in a question block, hiding in bushes and even beat them out of enemies, if you jump or ground pound them instead of kicking them while they're dizzy or spinning them to death. The system makes attacking enemies require a bit more thought based on what the situation calls for. Do you need more star bits or coins? Just make sure to defeat an enemy in an appropriate fashion and you'll be rewarded with a MacGuffin of your choice. I should probably mention the enemies in this game. They're your usual suspects you'd see in a Mario game. You have your Goombas, some Micro Goombas, Koopas, Magic Koopas and Bullet Bills. But there are also some new enemies which are introduced to right off the bat. These little guys are called Octagoombas. Apparently, and as the name sounds, there's some kind of Goomba subspecies. They walk side to side and try to headbutt you. They come in a few colours and their attack changes slightly, to where they will actually spit rocks at you. They remind me of Octorox from the Legend of Zelda series. There are also a bunch of enemies that are exclusive to the type of level you're in, such as the spinning top guys who knock Mario for a spin as they try to bump you into electrical fields, and these little balls of ice which can freeze you upon touching. There's also a fire variant of these guys. Beyond the main enemies though, you have your bosses which are nicely varied with enemies resembling some common bodies seen in past Mario games, but also some which are totally unique. For example, this giant two-legged robot you climb up like Shadow the Colossus or something. The new enemies mesh quite nicely with the old designs, which takes skills, so props to Nintendo for taking such care with the enemy designs. In terms of gameplay, Super Mario Galaxy sticks close to the Mario 64 format. You run around with the control stick, you have multiple flavours of jumps, including the three-tiered running jump, where each jump gets subsequently higher. The side flip, the beloved long jump also makes its welcome return after being absent from sunshine, and of course the crouch to back flip, which works way smoother and nicer than it did in Mario 64. At least in my opinion, which is nice, but for some reason in Galaxy, the side flip is a lot more difficult to execute and I don't know why. In Mario 64, and especially Sunshine, the side flip worked flawlessly. In fact, everything control wise was quick, responsive and snappy, but for some reason in Galaxy, it just doesn't really work all that well. When running, you snap the stick in the opposite direction and instead of doing the skid that Mario would do to set up for a side flip, he oftentimes just turns. It's very bizarre, but could be entirely my fault. For the most part, all of these jumps and techniques work essentially the same as how they used to. That's not to say that Galaxy doesn't have anything different to offer though. You can't do Mario 64's variety of punches and kicks, but you can, as I mentioned previously, spin. While Mario can only spin in Galaxy as his main attack besides jumping on the heads of enemies, it actually works out quite well and demonstrates Nintendo's mentality towards game design. They don't just make random attacks and throw them in the game for no reason. Like with Super Mario Sunshine, they wanted Galaxy's gameplay to have a focus. Something that works in tandem with the rest of the game, only this time, instead of giving Mario a gadget slash companion like in Sunshine, they gave him a new ability slash companion. The spin! The ability given to him by a Luma that hangs out... uh... inside him? Or under his hat? I'm not sure exactly, but with a small flick of the Wiimote, Mario does a spin which serves multiple uses. It can attack enemies, knocking them off their feet, setting them up to be killed by kicking them so hard they burst into star bits. You can also use it to help you reach higher heights, help extend jumps a little further, you can knock attacks back at enemies, break crystals, use sling stars, launch stars, and even turn Mario into a makeshift screwdriver when the situation calls for it. <sighs> As you can tell from all this, it really does dominate every part of this game, so the phrase spin to win has never been more accurate. But fear not, as in typical Mario fashion, we have some wonderful power-ups to toy with. Super Mario Galaxy really did something quite unexpected with the power-ups this time around, going as far as to change timeless power-ups as iconic as the Fire Flower. For whatever reason, they decided that the Fire Flower needed a time limit, so instead of keeping the Fire Flower until you take a hit, like literally every other game before this, it just sort of runs out, which honestly kind of sucks. The fact that it runs out after about 20 seconds or so isn't even incorporated into the gameplay much, and the ways it is incorporated aren't all that interesting and makes you wonder why they bothered to change things up in the first place. The same applies with the Ice Flower. This power-up I can maybe understand having a time limit due to its use. It lets you walk and skate in water. It even lets you wall kick up waterfalls. It's definitely one of the more fun and interesting power-ups in the game, but even then I could see this power-up working perfectly fine without a time limit. It really is a questionable decision. Now, power-ups come in all shapes and sizes, and not simply flowers. What's a Mario game without some mushroom power-ups? This game tried to be totally fresh. In one of the earlier galaxies in the game, we get introduced to the bee mushroom, which, as you can imagine, gives Mario a bee suit and allows him to fly and climb in honeycomb walls, but for whatever reason gets changed back to normal when he touches water. I don't really know why. I guess Nintendo just decided they hate power-ups. So we have a bee mushroom, and next comes the boo mushroom. The boo mushroom kills Mario, and you have to live at the rest of the game as a ghost! No Mario, don't walk toward the light. Uh, oh. Or he turns into a boo until the light shines on him. It's a pretty neat power-up, honestly. It lets you float freely and turn invisible to pass through certain walls, and for some reason every other boo has the hots for boo Mario. Who can resist that dashing mustache? I mean, it's just so curly. Kinda like a spring. Wow. 
What a segue. I mean, it works considering the next one is a spring mushroom. I know this isn't something cool looking like Spring Man from ARMS. It's just a literal spring. They took Mario, shoved him in a spring, and now he's suffering immeasurably. I mean, just look at it. You're constantly bouncing and it just looks uncomfortable. The spring suit is somewhat useful, but like most power-ups in the game, it's pretty underused. I think that's the problem with the power-ups in this game. They're too context-specific. They don't work all that well without a particular goal in mind in any given level. It's not like previous Mario games where they were just sort of there and contributed to the experience. The spring suit is only used a few times, but I feel like it's used decently, albeit not very often. You hold the A button to do a big bounce, and you can even bounce off walls, and with a bit of strategy and precision, you can use it effectively. Now, there's one more power-up, but I don't really know what to say about it. I mean, it's a red star, but you can only use it in areas of the hub world, so it's not really worth all that much. But it does let you fly around freely. Honestly, you don't get the star until at least halfway through the game. It helps getting around to the various observatories and help pick up the one-ups scattered around the place, but beyond one quest, which is simply to pick up a bunch of coins, it's sorely underused, but I can sort of see why. It's not like the wing cap in Super Mario 64, which requires momentum and skill to maintain flight. The red star power just flies in a straight line, not requiring much beyond making sure that you're flying in the right direction, so in terms of gameplay it's a bit dull and I can see why it wasn't used more prominently. Unfortunate, but I don't think we're missing out all that much. And last but not least, there's the rainbow star which just serves as our invincibility power up, which if I'm not mistaken is the first invincibility power up in a 3D Mario game. I suppose you could say the Metal Cat from Super Mario 64 was invincibility, but turning invincible was more of a side effect of it rather than the sole purpose of it. The side effects of the Rainbow Star though are fun. Mario runs much faster while invincible and has his arms stretched out to the side like someone who watched way too much Naruto. When you jump, you somersault wildly through the air. Again, this power up gets used quite sparingly but it has a few interesting uses since it allows you to defeat enemies you wouldn't normally be able to defeat such as the big chain chomp ball guys and many more. Now there is one more very interesting caveat which is present throughout most of Mario Galaxy, and it's probably one of the most fun yet pain in the ass things in the game, and that's the gravity. To put it simply, on certain objects Mario can walk up, around and over anything, provided it has its own gravitational pull. See a slope leading up a wall, you can walk up that wall. See a ball floating in the middle of a level, chances are you can walk on it however you want. Even the Toad spaceships piloted by Captain Toad himself have their own gravity. Gravity is well used throughout the game, some levels using it more than others. I mean, it is no way realistic at all since you'll have a small spaceship floating just overhead and get close enough Mario will cling to the outside. It's almost like if you walked outside and saw a slope leading up the side of a building and now you can walk up that building. Based on my 24 years of life, I don't think that's how gravity works. I mean, it's not like I play Mario for the realism, only really big bodies would have their own source of gravity. Oh, ha ha. Not unlike Super Mario 64, Galaxy has a hub world where you'll spend a large chunk of the game since you return there after every level. I have some stuff to say about this. Super Mario 64 had Princess Peach's Castle to explore, Super Mario Sunshine had Delfino Island, and Super Mario Galaxy has the Comet Observatory. Now, what's more fun than a good comparison, huh? For Galaxy, they sort of changed the way hub worlds work. In Super Mario 64 and even Sunshine, you'd run around until you either find a painting or M mark to jump in, then you'd select a star or shine sprite. And while each star took place in the same level, it would sometimes load the level with different bits and pieces added in, which were specific to that star. For Galaxy, they took a slightly different approach. Maybe they thought playing the same level upwards of six times would be tiresome or something? So in Galaxy, each level only has three normal stars to collect. You will return to other levels for bonus stars though. The levels are a great deal more linear than in 64 or Sunshine. Everything you see is incidental and just serves to help push you in the right direction, and there isn't much in terms of exploration. So instead of having high numbers of stars per level, they chose to instead throw in more levels. Not necessarily a bad move, but the trade off with this is that the Wii discs would eventually run out of space, so what ends up happening is that you come across levels which are essentially clones of past levels with only slightly edited, with perhaps some models reused in a new configuration. Or they simply take the same level and change the season, click clock wood style. Levels in this game are referred to as galaxies, and you access levels in typical 3D Mario style by acquiring power stars. The more you get, the more levels will open up through these little pod shaped areas called observatories, each observatory containing a handful of levels. Once you get enough stars, you click on a galaxy and it will turn into a level. You can now access it. So what kind of missions or quests, or whatever you like to call them, are in Super Mario Galaxy? Quite a nice variety actually. As I mentioned, each level has three standard stars to collect. These types of stars are usually things like climb to the top of the level, solve this problem for a character, collect so many of these small silver stars to make a big star, or your usual boss fights, all of which this time have a large emphasis on gravity and spinning abilities, which is good. At least it isn't the homogenized boar fest you see in Super Mario 3D World, 
Oh, what's that? The Koopa guy is spinning. I guess I'll jump in his head. Oh, what's that? The Koopa girl is throwing a boomerang and cloning herself. I guess I'll jump on the really obvious one's head. Now remember, kids, story is bad for Mario. That, however, is good, apparently. In total, the game has 120 stars, which seems to have become the norm for 3D Mario games these days. Interspersed amongst all these main quests, you'll encounter a bunch of mini-games. These can range from riding on a ball with motion controls, or riding on a fish with motion controls, or blowing on a bubble with the IR sensor. These mini-games are surprisingly fun, even with the motion controls, except that one where you ride in a stingray. Somehow, the turning feels so sluggish, and you desperately try not to fall off. All I can say is it's good that these were kept as mini-games. I mean, I'm sure enough people will take issue with the spin being motion controlled already. There's also the interesting prankster comets, which will fly by levels and cause all kinds of variables to be set in the level. There are a total of five different comets which can pass by and just change the rules of any given level. There's a speedy comet, which just applies a time limit, so you have to rush through a level before the time runs out. The daredevil comet, which makes it so Mario only has one HP, which is surprisingly difficult. You'll find it's very easy to get hit in this game, and there's this one boss which you have to complete with a Daredevil Comet, and my god, when I played this as a youngling, this one was my 120th star, and it broke my soul. Next, we have the Fast Foe Comet, which is an oddly specific title, and is probably the most underused of the lot. Only appearing twice throughout the whole game, essentially this speeds up the attack patterns of enemies, which can make things quite tricky, especially this one level with the Thwomps, because in Galaxy, Thwomps are one-hit kills, get squished, and you are done. There's also the Cosmic Comet, which is sort of a callback to Super Mario Sunshine. A clone of Mario called Cosmic Mario appears, and you have to race against him to be the first of the star. Pretty straightforward. This game likes its racing levels. And lastly, there's the Purple Comet, which doesn't come until much later in the game, and this one I'd say is a callback to Super Mario 64. Essentially, the levels are filled with 100 purple coins, and you need to find them all for the star to appear. But some of these can be brutal, throwing in time limits and some really tricky levels. Expect to get frustrated at least once when going through this game. To say the least, they do try and get the most out of what's found in the game. Even the main levels tend to have hidden stars, which you can access by feeding a hungry Luma a bunch of star bits to the point of exploding, and essentially they transform into another part of the level. Seriously, are those Lumas okay when they transform and stuff like that? Now one thing I think is very important to talk about are the controls, especially when relating to the gravity bending gameplay, because it can be a bit weird. Now I don't need to explain again how you actually control things, but more how it feels. Super Mario Galaxy definitely tries its best to feel familiar, even with the Wiimote nunchuck control combination, so you can pick up and play it very similarly to how you would Mario 64 or Sunshine. You run, you jump, the camera is finicky and annoying, pretty typical for Mario really, but I do have some major issues which I found during playing to be very annoying. Firstly, the gravity. Now, as I said, the gravity is fun. It's interesting, and slingshotting yourself around a small object and messing with intertwining gravity fields is amazing. A true feat of gaming physics, you would say. But, you are all aware of control orientation resetting. So, for instance, say you're holding left, and as such are moving left, then the camera, based on an event, swings around Mario 90 degrees, but you're still holding left. Even though you're holding left, he's now running towards you, so you would need to let go of the stick, let it reset, and now when you hold left again, you'll once again be running left. Makes sense? Okay, now take that concept, but instead of the camera swinging around Mario, imagine you're running around a ball or some other curved object. Cling to it with the gravity and the camera stays stationary. It feels like in these situations the controls never do what you want. I've even had it where Mario will just start running in circles, and I have no choice but to let the control stick reset. Hell, even when the camera follows Mario, he still has issues controlling, as the more you run in any given direction, the more you can sort of feel the controls just going a bit off. Beyond my issues with the gravity, I have one more gripe about the way this game controls, and I want to say right now, I like this game. I actually do. I like this game, and I think it should go without saying, but I can dislike certain aspects of something, but still like overall. Okay, now that that's out of the way, Mario is just too slow. This one might be a bit weird, but what I mean by this is everything can feel like it takes too much time. For instance, in Super Mario Galaxy, when you're standing still and begin to run, you can see a cloud of dust appear at Mario's feet for a chunk of time. This serves as Mario's speeding up. It's his acceleration, and I think it's this which gives me trouble with the side flip, since you need to be in full run before being able to side flip, which means side flipping in tight areas is not really possible. But going beyond that, it can give me some serious problems because during the startup animation, instead of executing a long jump, you'll do a backflip, and so many times this has messed me up. Mario is just so damn slow. Like, he just runs a little slower than I'd like him to. When he walks off an edge, he loses all his momentum. This can make simple things like dropping off a ledge add time. Now, you'd think for a game like Mario, 
this wouldn't be a big issue. But there's actually a lot of instances in this game where you're either racing or have some kind of time limit. So add a time limit to the gravity messing up your directional controls, ledges slowing you down and executing incorrect jumps. It doesn't happen 100% of the time, but it happens enough to where this can become frustrating. Now at this point, it's no secret. Super Mario Galaxy is a gorgeous game. I've said it before and I'll say it again, Nintendo is the best at getting the most out of their game's visuals, even with less powerful hardware. And Super Mario Galaxy is a perfect example of art direction over photorealism. Super Mario Galaxy looks timeless, and this game in particular was a bit of a turning point for Mario. These days, I think it's safe to say Mario games have found their style. As much as I'll shit on Super Mario 3D World for various things, it's a beautiful game with a cartoony, almost Pixar-esque look to it. And I feel like Galaxy was the first game to start pushing Mario in that direction, and it really shines through with the character designs. New characters like Rosalina and Lumas fit perfectly in the Mario universe, and my god does Bowser look amazing in this game. He went from this... Junior, I've got something... ...to this. He has a much more intimidating appearance, a nice scale like texture in his body and more detail in his shell and not to mention his luscious flowing locks of hair. Bowser Jr is also here, but meh. The rivalry between Mario and Bowser feels so much more real here, I think it's because of the setup and interaction. Think about it, in Super Mario 64 you were just plopped into the boss arena, exchanged some conversation over one text box, then just fought. Super Mario Sunshine? Well, a uh, bathtub fight. And the voice acting? Ugh, need I say more? Whereas here, things are much more cinematic and set the tone of the scene much better. Peach exclaims when she sees Mario, her hero has arrived, the happy-go-lucky Mario has a very serious expression, and the setting and music is nothing short of epic. And when you defeat Bowser, it seriously looks like something out of Star Wars. I don't know, maybe it's showing that I'm a big fan of Bowser as a character. I mean, I constantly have a Bowser amiibo on my desk where I work, and hell, I even named my cat after him. I don't know why I like him so much, I guess I just think he's a very creatively designed character. I'm sorry Mr Miyamoto. You make wonderful characters. Story ain't a bad thing though. And now we'll get to the mythical lost Super Mario Galaxy story. The name Yoshiaki Koizumi may or may not be familiar to you. He was the director on Super Mario Galaxy, although these days he's better known as the suave looking guy from the Switch event. He sort of butted heads with Miyamoto and had a deep story planned for Galaxy, but as you can guess, Miyamoto stepped in and put a stop to that, and what we were left with was a little hint of a Rosalina backstory snuck in by Koizumi. In the form of a story Rosalina herself tells to a bunch of Lumas in the library of the observatory, and I don't want to ruin it for you, it's actually a somewhat sad story which evokes feelings we've all felt at one point or another. Remember when you were a kid, and maybe at some point for all of 10 seconds or so, you lost sight of your parents, that feeling of fear and dread. It drudges up feelings like that and makes for a very interesting read. It shows that Galaxy really could have nailed the story since the writing staff clearly knew how to write an evocative tale. Even without a story, Super Mario Galaxy is a marvel to both the eyes and the ears. The game's music and visuals work beautifully in tandem, and this game has a stellar soundtrack that was praised back in the day for being one of the first games to have a proper orchestral soundtrack. Super Mario Galaxy has music that is instantly recognisable, that helps fit the tone of the level it's used in, it can have a feeling of exploration, of tension, or something silly. It feels like every part of this game was crafted with care and attention, and while I have my gripes with it, Super Mario Galaxy is a noteworthy installment in the series, and I would never hesitate to recommend it to anyone, because you're guaranteed to have a great time. Hey there, like my videos? Why not leave a like and help me rise up through the YouTube algorithm? Also subscribe for plenty more reviews and more of my new show, Can You Do It? And if you have some extra money lying around, why not consider pledging to me on Patreon? That's all, thanks for watching.